Hi, my name is David Wilson. I was born in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Um, when we were younger, we had a house fire, burnt our house down, and my parents and the four kids moved to Pennsylvania. I was four years old at the time, and my, my daddy took his life at that point, and it was a long struggle for my mom, because, you know, having four children and no husband, and it was pretty tough on her. And then uh, my mother remarried again when I was 10 years old, and we moved to a dairy farm. And the dairy farm was great. I mean, we got to enjoy the outdoors, and, and it was a lot of work. Um, the only trouble was is there was a lot of drinking going on. Uh, my parents were both big drinkers, and uh, I learned how to drink. I learned how to drink at the early age of 12. You know, I always heard if you work like a man, you drink like a man, but and churches were for funerals and weddings, and that was, that was about it. I, I had a, a bad marriage. Drinking probably was the biggest cause of it. Um, but when I found that hole in my stomach and I didn't know what it was, it was the, the missing God. And I, I um, found the way to, to um, change my life. It was a real tough thing to do. Around 2005, um, I had an aneurysm. It, uh, it was a Wednesday night. My, I, I got a pain in my head. They took me to the hospital, and they couldn't find anything wrong with me. So just before I was about to go, they, they did an MRI. And the MRI found the, the bleed, and they uh, rushed me to um, the hospital in, in, in Charlotte. And they flew me there in a, in a helicopter. That was, I don't remember much, but I was there, I know, three days. And then that's when they operated on me. And I don't know much. My, my wife went through more trouble than I went through. It took me a long time to recover from the um, aneurysm. I, I couldn't drive for six months. Um, I, I, I struggled to learn how to do things. Um, I just sat around most of the time because I couldn't function. Um, but it, it brought me closer to God. It was a, it was a, a learning experience. Um, it really brings you to your knees when you're when when something like that happens because most people just have a headache and they sit down on the couch and then they 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 don't make it through. I went from a, a drinking man to a, a a good Christian coming to church and and helping out. I'm I'm involved with the with the VBS. I'm involved with the school outreach. Um, I'm involved with the with the cafe. I went through a bit of depression when I was um, recovering, and, and I lost a lot of self-esteem, and and uh, I still struggle with depression. Uh, but you know, God's word has kept me going. David Wilson is a man who got one of the most beautiful things in all of life, a second chance. He was morally and spiritually bankrupt. Drinking had overtaken his life, and his first marriage was ruined because of it. But God found him and spiritually redeemed and rescued him. And today, he is one of our most reliable and trusted and needed servants here at He's Alive Church, he made good 
on that second chance. Not only did he get a second chance, he made good on it. But then he got, if that wasn't enough, he got the thing that a lot of people don't get. He got a second chance physically. Most of the people that I know who had brain aneurysms of that sort are no longer here. Typically, you don't get up from that. And yet, there he sits, right there, that man. And he got a second chance. And I want to emphasize again, he made good on it. He's not just sitting around, come here during the week, and you'll see that man here volunteering his time to ministry. And he was impacted by that second chance. And I, I say that to you today to give you encouragement because if you are here today and you are down in the muck and in the mire and in a bad way, and you might find yourself needing a second chance, and you came looking for one, and maybe you need tangible, visible evidence that God does give second chances. Well, there it sits right there before your eyes. It's a miracle, people. But just in case that's a little too far for you, you need only look to your left or your right. Because the mere fact that you sit here today is verifi verifiable proof that because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our God is into second chances. And every single person in this room has been the benefactor of that. Some of you may not have yet accepted it or received it but I assure you the offer is on the table and it's on the table today and I want to share with you a story today about the very first person in all of history post-resurrection that is who got a second chance. The first person recorded in history to actually post-resurrection receive a second chance. Perhaps you've heard of him. His name is Simon Peter. And his story is told in the Gospels. And we'll, we're going to jump around to a couple parts of that story and a couple parts of the Gospel today. But I want to start in the book of Matthew chapter 26. If you've got your Bibles, pull them out. I hope you do have your Bibles. Scripture's one of our principles now. Remember, we believe this is God's Word. We actually believe He wrote it. Because we believe He wrote it, we believe it to be perfect and without error. And because we believe that, we believe it to be the objective standard of truth by which we measure all truth against and by which we submit and conform our lives to daily. And we believe that this word has the power to bring life to our dead places and bring second chances today. You believe that, say, hey now. So pull out your Bibles. Maybe, I love this sound. But maybe you're much more modern and it's on that today. Pull it out. Matthew 26. Part of Peter's story, we're at the latter part of his story here, <clears throat> at least pre-resurrection. Jesus has taken all his disciples up to the Garden of Gethsemane. And before they go in, he gathers around them. And he says, now boys, and then this happens. It says, Jesus told them, this very night... You will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd 
And the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Interesting thing to notice. We always focus on Peter like as the one who denied Jesus. Because that's the only one that's recorded. But if you'll notice, they all ran. They all fell away. Every single one of the disciples was guilty of abandoning Jesus. We don't have the details behind the rest of their stories. We have Peter's. But we always single him out. But they all blew it. Every one of them. They all needed a second chance. Just like everybody in this room needed one. And likely most of us could use one today. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And that's a, just a beautiful, that verse 32, but. He's saying, y'all all going to abandon me. You're all going to fall off. You're all going to totally blow it. But. Oh, yeah. There's always a but with Jesus. And that's a beautiful thing. He said, after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Not me. Even if the world is going this way, I'm going to be going that way with you, Lord. I don't care what the world does. I don't care what the world says. I don't care what the rest of them do. Jesus, I'm with you. I will never fall away. You ever told, anybody ever told God that? Anybody, anybody ever told God, Lord, oh, I don't care what they say. I don't care what they do. I will never. And then you find yourself right up in the mix of that thing you said you would never do. Anybody ever done that? Don't lie. Don't be ashamed. Because you're not alone. How many times have we promised? How many of my college dormitory mates that I served as a designated driver for said on the night before, I'm sorry, I'll never do this again. Sure enough, I get a call Friday night. Hey, man, can you drive us down to blah, 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 blah. How many times have we said, I'll never, even if the world, too many Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. And Jesus looked at him and he said, I'll tell you the truth, Peter. This very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me. Not once, not twice, but three times. You will blow it multiple times. Not just once, dude. Even though you swore, but you're going to blow it multiple times. Anybody know what that's like? Blow it multiple times. But Peter, in true form to his character, declared, Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And get this, all the other disciples said the same. They all blew it too. You ever, you've been in that place, whether it's even, maybe it's God, maybe it's somebody else, you said, I will never. And somehow down the road, you find yourself right in the middle of doing that very thing you said that you would never do. Anybody in here vowed, growing up, your parents did things? And you said, I'll never do that. And now that you're a parent or you're an adult, you find yourself. Anybody ever been there? How many people have done that? The rest of you are lying or you're not old enough. How many of you wake up one day and you go, my gosh, I'm my dad. Or I'm my mom. You know, I mean, my dad in church, of course, he still does this. Oh, he do it everywhere. But especially in church. It would always be in the sermon, too. My dad, he carried this handkerchief. Now, this is not a handkerchief. This is just some tissue. But he would carry that thing, and he would pull it out. And he, in church, and he'd be like, and he'd be like. And he would stick his fingers up his nose and blow. 
And in the middle of church, and people would, and I'm not joking, people would be like, and it would, it would draw the attention of everybody to us. It was like. And then he would go, and it was so loud. It was louder than the organ. I was sure, I was certain Jesus was going to split the sky wide open and go, oh, my bad. I thought that was the trumpet. <laughs> That's how loud it was awful. And then he would do this. He'd fold it over, put it back in that pocket. Some of y'all, you know, you're here. You have them in your pockets right now. And I remember as a kid saying, I will never do that. And I haven't. I own no handkerchiefs. However, I have found myself many times, and it's interesting, and this is a sad thing. I mean, um, as you grow older, you just find that more things are in your nose that need to come out. Some of you people 40 and under, people 40 and under enjoy this time. It changes drastically. So you find the need for tissue and things and such. So I have found myself at times with tissue in my pocket. And then what do you do? Put it in your pocket. And then what's worse, you pull it out. And you. some of you ladies, you have these things in your pocketbook right now. I've seen you. You pull it out, you use it, and you put it right back in that pocketbook. And then some of you will give it to your children later to use. You know it. It's true. And so I haven't done what my dad did, but I've just taken a version or a form of it and done the same thing. Worse yet, Sometimes we same things we say we'll never do. We elevate it. Sometimes you don't have a tissue. And you don't have anything. You're just out and, well. And that's why I tell my boys, boys, that's what your shirt tail's for. Right? Don't, some of you know. Now, I don't do that on Sunday. Y'all are safe. But I have found myself even if not the same way, philosophically, I'm my dad. I'm, well, I've said enough about that. But it's just like, God, these things you say you never will do, and then one day you wake up and you're doing them. And it's, it's hilarious and it's funny when it's just those things, you know. Not, I mean, just little trivial things. But it's catastrophic when it's sin. It is an absolute catastrophe when you find yourself in the middle of the very thing you swore you would never do. I assure you, there is no worse moment than that when you become aware of your capacity to completely blow it. Peter swore, Lord, I'll never. And yet, we know what happened, right? It happened just the way Jesus said it. He would deny him three times. And we ask ourselves, how did Peter get to this place. How does anybody get to that place? If you turn over to Mark 14, it will give us a bit of a clue. Just before, or right after Jesus made this prophetic statement, and before it actually happened, they had arrested him, and they're leading him through. And Mark 14, beginning at verse 53, tells us that they took Jesus to the high priest. And all the chief priests, elders, and teachers of the law came together. And the Bible says there that Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. 
And there he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. And that's when it all broke loose. Now you got to give Peter credit here because at least he's following. At least he's checking this thing. All the other disciples know where to be found. They have, boom, invisible. They have gone underground. So at least Peter has the courage enough to, even though he's at a distance, kind of get up and see what this thing is about. Peter's not a coward. He's not a fool. He's not a bad person. But he lost his way a little bit. And if you notice, the Bible, Mark records it there. Peter followed, verse 54, Mark 14. Peter followed Jesus at a distance. That's the first time that happened in three years. For three years, he had walked beside this man. So much so that he was willing to say, I will die for you. And then in the, right before that in the garden, they came and they seized Jesus. Peter pulls out a sword and whoop, chops off a guy's ear. This dude is a man's man. He is not afraid until now. And all of a sudden, after three years of being tied, shrapnel hits circumstances change and he finds himself at a distance now the gospel directly refers to physical proximity but there's metaphorically much more than that there is a spiritual proximity that is lacking and peter finds himself at a distance you ever you ever been in that place you found yourself at a distance you were tight with Jesus for so long. But then that thing happened at the job. Or this thing happened in my marriage. Or this thing happened in my relationship. Or this amount of stress. Or this pressure. Or something happened. And now you are following at a distance. Maybe it was a disease. Maybe God took somebody from you that you're still mad at him about. And today as we speak, some of you are following at a distance. Because you're not really sure you can ever trust him again. Peter was following Jesus at a distance. He, give him credit, at least he was there. But why was he so far back? Because he was scared. He was scared for his life. And to get close to Jesus in this moment would be to risk too much for him. So he put space in between he and Jesus. Because everybody knows it's much safer in the back. It's much safer at a distance. It's much safer when we don't sign up. It's much safer when we keep our money rather than give it. It's much safer when we don't fully commit, because after all, what if none of this is true? Then all I got is me. For Peter, that moment came where it was like, what, what if all this is just a sham? What if this guy I've been following for three years is not who he said he was? So I'm, and there's distance for the first time. And notice what Peter thought was his safest position turns out to be the most dangerous position. Because it was the very thing that led him to do what he was about to do. That led him to the place that he vowed he would never be. Hear me. Putting distance between you and Jesus is the most dangerous place you can be. Staying in the back all the time. I don't mean necessarily sitting on the back row physically. I mean, I mean metaphorically. Staying at a distance, never signing up, never showing up, never getting involved, never throwing yourself into it. Hear me. You need to hear me. That's the most dangerous place you can be. I know you think it's safe, but it's not. And we think we're free from shrapnel back there, but you're not. Satan deceptively has you in the most dangerous place you can be. And you are one second 
from swimming in the pool of, but I'll never, how did I end up here? But to close the gap. Some of you today are at a distance. For you, churches, maybe once a month, twice a month at most. Where are you at? You're at a distance. You'll swear up and down to your family that you're not, but you are. You know it. And that led Peter to this moment. Mark writes it, verse 66 of chapter 14. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. And when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You were with that Nazarene Jesus? But he denied it. (laughs) I don't know or understand what you're talking about, girl. And he went into the entryway. And then the servant girl came in and saw him again. And there she said again to those standing around him, This fellow is one of them. I'm telling you. And again, he denied it. I don't know what you're talking about. And then after a little while, those standing near said to Peter, Dude, surely you are one of them. I mean, you're a Galilean. And Peter blew a gasket. The Bible says he began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Remember, this is the guy who just... A few hours earlier was saying, I'll never. Even if I have to die with you, Jesus. And now here he is. I don't know the man. Wow. The capacity of the saints to blow it is enormous. That's not hypocritical. That's spiritual. When we get at a distance from Jesus. And immediately the rooster crowed the second time. And then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. And I love the way Luke writes it in the 22nd chapter because he adds this one little statement. It says, Peter replied in Luke 22, verse 60, that last one, man, I don't know him. And just as he was speaking, Luke records it, the rooster crowed. And then there's this verse, verse 61. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. And then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. I want you to understand that Peter is not a guy who weeps bitterly. He's a fisherman. He probably done a whole lot more cursing than he had crying. He would pull his sword and cut off somebody's ear. He'd just soon fight and then cry. So what is it that makes this dude weep beyond control? It was that moment when the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. What kind of look do you think Jesus gave him in that moment? You think it was, boy, I'm going to get you. You think it was, I ought to grab your rear end and whip it upside 
down all over this place. I'm going to kick your own. You think it was that look? You think it was, I told you. You think it was, I'm going to remember this. That's what Peter would have expected. Because Peter would just soon fight and cuss than cry. But see, I think the look that Jesus gave Peter in that moment was, oh, Peter. Oh, Peter. But I still love you. And I'm not giving up on you. And I think that's what made Peter weep bitterly. Because at his worst moment, when he had completely blown it, Jesus said, but I'm not giving up. And then this happened. On resurrection day, when the two Marys go to the tomb in Mark 16, verses 6 and 7, an angel's sitting there and he says to him, Don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified, but he's risen. He's not here. See the place where he lay? But here it is. But go and check this out. Tell his disciples and what? And Peter. He didn't have to say and Peter. He could have just said go tell all them because they were all guilty. But God knew. He remembered the moment. When he looked Peter square in the eye. And Peter ran out. And was broken. And what he's saying is. You make sure Peter hears this. You make sure Peter hears. Because the resurrection. Everything's being made new. And Peter. You make sure Peter knows. That I'm giving people. A second chance. And him too. And you know what God did? Jesus restored him. And in Acts chapter 2, Peter's the guy who preaches the message where the Holy Spirit comes. And 3,000 people give their lives to Christ because of that word. And this thing that you and I are sitting in today called the church begins. Jesus made him an apostle. And he wrote two of the books that are in this very Bible that we still are taught by and encouraged by today. That's what God does to people who blow it. He doesn't whip their butt upside one down and the other. He looks them in the eye and he says, Oh, oh, Mark. But I'm not giving up on you. And then he takes them. When they receive that. And he uses them to do. Amazing. So if you need a second chance today, that's what the resurrection says. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to stand to your feet. And I want you all to throw up on the screen that verse from Mark 16.
Mark 16. And I'm going to read verse 6. And then you guys are going to read verse 7 with me. All right? And here's what we're going to do. I'm going to read this part. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. This could go for all of us. Look, don't, don't be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, and boy, do we ever, who was crucified for us. But he is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? And here it is. I want you to read this part with me, but where it says, and Peter, I want you to insert your name where Peter's name was. And I want you to do it loudly. You ready? But go, tell his disciples and Mark. Do it again. Let's go from the top. But go. Tell his disciples and Mark that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. He did it. Thank God. So let's give him thanks today. And if you are here today and You need a second chance. You need a second chance at something. This altar's open. You can make an altar right where you are. But don't miss it. Like David Wilson over there. Make good on it. Maybe today you're perfect. You're in a good place. You don't you you make good on all your second chances. Well, you better thank God and you better draw near.